we, we can see you guys sitting there high, um, and we see, uh, it looks like, a, is that a C-arm shot and, and the cadaver? Um, so we have a very nice view of this whole thing. Um, so before, before you guys get started, uh, I, have a, I just want to ask a couple of questions to kind of set the tone, because I think it matters. So we talked about uh, doing reductions in sequence, and, I, and, I th and, and so there's two questions that I want to ask you pers in your personal practice. What's the, what's the rapidity of the sequence that you employ, and what is the um, maximum amount of weight that you're comfortable applying this to a traction weight um, to get someone reduced? Because it because I think it matters. Because I can see on the on the video that we have a pair of stainless steel tongs um, that you're going to be using, um, but not all tongs can withstand high weight reductions. Um, the graphite titanium ones won't won't allow you to do that. So what what do you guys do in your institutions in terms of rapidity? Do you do a high a rapid sequence? Reduction, or do you do like the our Israeli friends say, let people hang out for a couple of hours while you're waiting for things to relax? What's what's your preference? Well, I I would not wait days. Uh, I do think that um, muscle relaxation is important, but I think it's how we do is pretty rapid. So uh, put the tongs on. Uh, add weights. In the old days, we would get uh, regular x-rays rather than the C-arm, so by the time they would go uh, process the film and bring it back, we would put the, the, the next weights on and, 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 and go from there. So um, pretty rapid. The most I've ever uh, put on is 140 pounds. These stainless steel tongs can tolerate that. Uh, the problem usually is, though, having enough weight. 140 pounds is, is a lot of weight. Uh, the uh, MRI compatible tongs do not tolerate that much. But I tell you, once you get past maybe 50 pounds or so, there's some issue going on. In my experience, it's usually you have a facet fracture. And in facet fractures, you're really never going to reduce those because you're actually pulling through the fracture and you're not going to be able to disengage that fractured fragment and, and reduce it. So if you get more than 50 pounds, I think it, it's, it, it's something else is going on. and it's probably not going to work. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, it, you know, we try to do this as quickly as possible. We'll do it, actually, bring the patient to the ICU and do it in the ICU. That's the fastest place we can get it done. It's much faster than the ER. My personal weight limit has been 120 pounds or two-thirds of body weight. I, I haven't gone higher than 120 pounds, but you, you can technically go up to two-thirds of the body weight. So, so why don't you guys just start um, your procedure, tell us exactly, you know, kind of walk us through it in terms of, is there any tricks in terms of how you apply the tongs, where you apply the tongs, how you set the patient up, bed position, uh, just kind of walk us through your, your technique here, because I think there are a lot of subtleties to doing this that often get missed when you just say, put on tongs and pull. Well, yeah, let's forget for a second what kind of injury we have here, and let's just talk about what we're going to do. Now, the, the first part is actually applying the tongs safely uh, so that they don't rip through the skull or you don't cause an epidural hematoma. So what I do is I, I don't know if you can see the side here of the, the, the skull. We could certainly um, maybe... We're just going to tilt the head for the purposes of this exercise. But what I do is I will figure out where the external auditory meatus is, where the pinna is, I'll go a finger breadth above the pinna in line with the external auditory meatus. Right about there will be my entry point for the tongs right here. And so what I try to do is that stays below the equator of the skull, and it stays out of the temporal bone, which is obviously the very thin bone. You don't want this thing up here, okay, because you can punch right through the skull pretty easily right here. So this is the thickest part of the skull right here, just below the equator, is where I will go ahead and make my, uh, make my entry point. Now what I do is I'll go ahead and use local anesthetic, sort of raise a wheel, and then go ahead and inject down to the periosteum and make sure that the periosteum is nice and numb. I'll then use a small stab blade, like a 15 blade, to go ahead and make a small incision in the scalp, just in more, more than help of entry of the skull uh, into, the, into the skull itself, but just so that I know that the patient is anesthetized. So that's where we differ. I do not use a scalpel. I will do the wheel and go straight to the periosteum and put a lot in the periosteum 
but not use a, a scalpel and just uh, place the sharp pins in. So what I'm doing right now is just making my small stab incision where I can go ahead and dent, feel down to the periosteum. Now, the tongs themselves, what you want to do is go ahead and get the pin all the way out so that you're not scraping across the scalp as you go ahead and put these on. And you want to go ahead and this internal nut here, make sure that it's all the way out. Now, the, the other thing you want to do is when you tighten these up, there's a small indicator pin that you'll see right here. See how that's recessed right now? That thing's going to have to pop out. And that's how you know that this thing is seated well enough. Now, you want to go ahead and go back within 12 to 24 hours and make sure that indicator pin is still popped out and make sure everything's tightened down. You don't want to retighten after about 24 hours or so, but you do want to go back after 12 to 24 hours if you're going to take that long or keep people in traction that long and make sure it's stayed tightened down. So let's go ahead and put this on. I can see this side quite well. The other thing I like to do is make sure I've got plenty of room above the patient so that I can see from side to side and sort of move side to side. So it'd be nice to be able to get a little bit more side to side here. But we'll go ahead and do this. And so what I'll do is I'll start tightening down one side and then symmetrically tighten down the other side that you can see right there. So that you're kind of doing this simultaneously almost to go ahead and get these things seated down. Yeah, so I'll, I'm going to say a little bit. I would like to stand directly at the head exactly. of the patient, have both my hands on each one of these knurled uh, knobs, and then simultaneously with both my hands. Now, you need to understand which way you're tightening, right? You yep. don't want to tighten one and untighten the other, but symmetrically tighten them with both your hands at the same time. That's exactly right, because the whole idea behind this is symmetry, not asymmetry, so that you've got the, got the scalp over to one side or the skull rotated over to one side. Now what I'm doing is I'm tightening this down. Now I'm gonna start, it's starting to get some resistance here, so I'm gonna start looking for this indicator pin. Now I can't obviously turn the head to show you, but the indicator pin is over here on the patient's right side, and it is not yet popped. And you can see with my little finger here, here's where I'm looking at it. You'll obviously not see that from an AP view. So we'll go ahead and keep tightening this down. A Couple of turns on either side. Not quite there yet. And here we go. We start seeing it. Starting to come out Close. here. There we go. There we go. There we go. I wonder if we can, or once you turn the, turn the head so that Let's so turn they can the head. see what it looks like. Now the indicator pin is out, as you can see here. Okay, there see how that's popped out there? Now obviously you wouldn't turn the patient this way, but you know, that's what you wanna go ahead and look for to make sure that indicator pin is out. And then I'll also put a little gentle traction on here and just make sure it feels solid to me. And there we go. Now the next thing you wanna do is go ahead and tighten down this nut so that it go ahead and approximates the Gardner Wells tongs here to keep this pin in position so that it can't back out. So that's the next step right there. Okay, so the tongs are in place, and now we're ready to go ahead and add weight. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and put a string across the top of this, as you can see here, and then we have the pulley system at the top of the bed that we'll go ahead and make sure that's all set up before you start adding weight or before you even, frankly, put the tongs on so that you're ready so, to go when this, so, this all goes. So let me stop you for just a second. I think that's, does anyone have any questions about tong application? We got that. Is everybody clear on that? So, Rick, I, I take it you agree with Andrew that, I mean, people have talked about moving the tongs forward or backward to try to make, obtain a, a flexion moment or to, dislock, to unlock the facets, but I tend to do it like Andrew, which is to put it right in line with the spine. Um, exactly, and I'm gonna take what I'd rather do, so just to expand on that, if you put these tongs posterior to that, we're gonna induce a flexion moment we put an answer to that, we should induce an extension moment. I like to have it right in the middle and then work on flexion extension by the head. And, and to begin, before actually putting any traction on, I would want to make sure that the head is relatively flexed. I don't want to roll under the shoulders. If anything, I want maybe a little pillow under the head because we'll, what we want to do is distract in relative 
flexion. Certainly not distract in, in extension. That's a bad thing. So, so yeah, so, so give me the whole setup in terms of, uh, you said maybe a small pillow. Do you, is, where do you put so, your pulleys in terms of for the weight to get, the, where, where do you want to see the rope? What angle has it in, in terms of the okay. head and the neck? Do you put, do you use the he, he, bed in Trendelenburg, reverse Trendelenburg, uh, little tips and pearls? So unless we're putting tons of weight on, then you may put them in reverse Trendelenburg. I like them just flat and straight off the, the end of the bed. I just want to pull straight traction and then do the flexion extension based on the position of their head and, and their shoulders. So again, what's comfortable for them, you're talking to them, you don't want them uncomfortable or hurting more, but you, want, you, you don't want to roll under the shoulders to begin with. If anything, maybe a, a comfort a pillow under their head. Once you've distracted and you've reduced it, and then you extend them, put a roll under the shoulders, and then you can take the weights down a whole lot because now you're, you're stable. Once it's, it's reduced, you don't have to have a lot of weight on. So as long as you keep them extended then, then they should be stable to go around the hospital, get your MRIs, do, go to the OR, do, do whatever. Relocks their facets in position. Yep, in the extended position, yep. they should be stable. Now, before we do any weight, what I'll do is I'll use a quick uh, C-arm just to make sure that we're not over-distracted. Because one of the problems that you can have when you start putting on weight, go ahead and take a shot, you can over-distract, uh -oh. which we just did uh -oh. there. Okay, that's without any weight on, or that's with about five pounds of traction. So that's one of the problems and one of the contraindications to basically using traction, is if you have a pure distraction injury like this, so only low weight to begin with, right? Exactly. Five pounds. Maybe. Five pounds. Five pounds. Five pounds. And right look there. and make sure you're, especially the OC junction, right? That's where yeah. this could be disastrous. Go ahead and take another shot because now we're going to have to push the head back on, like here, <laughs> just to make sure that everything's, the facets are locked up again. Anything else? So, so just walk us, walk us through. A sequence now you you uh do it do an exam hang a weight um and then what what i'll do is i'll go ahead and start hanging five pounds now you can go five to ten pounds per level but I, you know if you have a c67 fracture dislocation this is you know a c56 injury and the, i mean i literally just pulled on with about five pounds of, of weight and sort of distracted it that much so i again will start with five five pounds and, and go up 10 pounds per, you know, from there each time I add on and get a go ahead and get an x-ray shot each level. Okay. So what we should see is the facet uh, joint, the, the tips, uh, approximating, you know, approx getting uh, more tip to tip rather than uh, the reverse shingle, right? And then once they are at the tips, you are distracted enough, and then you can put them in extension and then let the weight off, and it should be reduced. I mean, that's the subtle piece of this in looking at the x-rays. Now, unfortunately, this is a really unstable injury without actually facet dislocation. This is a vertically distracted. unstable <laughs> injury. Distracted injury, yes. So it's yeah. gonna be hard to show any reduction techniques yeah. with this. So. Talk, talk to me a little bit about the differences in your technique, if any, between bilateral and unilateral facet dislocations. Yeah, so first off, unilateral facet dislocations are usually harder to reduce because they're less unstable, right? Bilateral facet dislocations, you usually have more disruption posteriorly. Um, and with the unilateral facet dislocation, they are usually rotated to, to, to one side. We actually talked about, before we came here, about whether we do any manual, in my training we call it a flip and a flip-flop, where you actually would rotate manually to try to, again, um, so, sort of like sort a distal like radius this. fracture where you increase the deformity, distract, and then re reduce it. And so trying to do that manually, um, 
I think Dr. Daly has some experience with that, the yeah. flip and the flip-flop. Yeah, exactly. What I'll do is I'll rotate away from the side that the one facet is dislocated, go ahead and rotate it, try to flex at the same time, and then see if I can pop that joint back on uh, with an extension, letting somebody back into extension. Do, do you wait until the facet is perched on? Yes. Yeah, the C-arm shot, or I mean, at what point do you want to go through that kind of maneuver? I usually don't do that maneuver until I've started to fail just linear traction at usually 60 to 70 pounds, and somebody is neurologically very compromised, and I'm trying to really get them relocated. So I, I very rarely will do a manual manipulation. Jens, do you have any uh, pearls? I mean, you have as much experience with this as any of us. And I think this is actually a great uh, case example um, uh, because you never know what you uh, encounter until you have the first set of weights on. So what uh, Rick and um, Andrew showed there with the five pound massive over distraction is actually something I've encountered. And this is something you need to be very aware of. So that first image um, is a big deal. What we used to do with the fluoroscope, I don't know whether they still did at Harborview, is we used to um, actually print out the first uh, image as a baseline, hang it up, and then compare all the future images against that uh, to make sure we did not miss over distraction anywhere from the cranium down to C71. My question to Rick and Andrew is, how much over distraction of a segment do you accept before you just shut it down or change your technique? Well, I, I don't want to see any significant over distraction at, at all. Yeah, I, I, you know, I look at the disk spaces above and below and try to say, what does what a normal disk space look like? And then I'll take like one and a half times a normal disk space and say, after that, that's too much distraction. Like, for instance, I don't, can we get a, sh a lateral shot here? Okay, so that's less than a normal disk space. Go ahead and shot. That's clearly more than enough distraction. So that's too much right there. Aside from taking this patient to the operating room, what would you do with this patient now that you've recognized this? Would you put him into a halo or a sand sack him, tape his head? I mean, this is obviously a crassy, unstable neck. So traction is out. What's your next step here? I'd take him to the operating room. Yes. Until then, what would you do until then? This patient is obviously going to dislocate his neck uh, over the bumps in your hallways, even in beautiful Indiana. Yeah, I would uh, basically hold on to his uh, tongs and take, you know, follow him, follow him to the OR. Yeah, I'd, I'd use judicious sandbags around the top of the head so that it can't distract at all, and and also alert everybody that's transporting him what this X-ray looks like, show them how unstable this thing looks like. Sin did you ever try putting on the, the crown of a halo frame? Yeah, and then if you need to, because you can distract on those, on the new crowns that have the ability of distraction. And then in a case like this, you could just put on a polar front holding yeah. it in place for you. Yeah, so I, I think the question is, rather than putting Gardner Wells tongs, do you put an, an actual a halo ring on? And I don't because putting halo rings are harder to put on. Uh, these are super fast. I mean, you can put Gardner Wells tongs on in a matter of minutes. I mean, really, really fast. And I, I don't, my routine is not to treat a patient in a halo anyway. So having a halo ring on does me zero uh, advantage. So because of the complexity and the uh, longer it takes to put a halo ring on, I, I do not routinely do that. Yeah, the other thing is, with this particular injury, I'd worry very much about putting somebody in a halo, because I think halos, if you push down on their chest, can you get an x-ray shot there? You push down on their chest, shot again? You can distract them just as much as you can by pulling on their head. And that's what I'd worry about with a halo in this situation. Do you have any um, tips or pearls about uh, lower cervical, cervical thoracic junction dislocations uh, in terms of being able to see them radiographically, or is that a relative contraindication to doing a closed reduction? Yeah, I, I think clearly if you can't see well on, on the C-arm or X-ray, that's a contraindication. Now, there are some tricks that you can do, such as obliques. You can, you can get an oblique, and sometimes you can see farther uh, distal. I have reduced C7-T1 uh, uh, facet dislocations, but that can be tough. I mean, it, it can be hard. 
Yeah, the other thing, I mean, you have, you, you get it, somebody who can help you, they can pull on the arm so long as there's no extremity fractures and so forth and so on. And you put the patient in a little bit of Trendelenburg and go ahead and get their head up so that the body is being pulled away from that cervical thoracic junction. Uh, one more surgical question. Um, just as you're seeing this now, this is an obviously crassly unstable um, image. Uh, you took this patient to the uh, whatever reduction room without a MRI scan. Would you take the patient to the MRI scan first or would you be willing to take them to the OR and do an anterior plate and then re-image the patient? Yep, I would take them to the operating room and do it from the front. Yep, that's what I would do too. I'd tend to err on that. I mean, you, you know, you worry about the verts and things like that, but you could spend all, you know, hours and hours and hours doing a CTA and an MRI and all those kinds of things. That's not going to help the patient because every time you transfer them, there's a risk that you could dislocate this worse. Jens, you're raising your eyebrows, so. <laughs> no, I, I, I agree because I think that our major concern with going from to surgery is doing bringing something from the front drag, as Rick said, dragging it back into the canal. If you're gonna do it from the front, you can, you can take down the PLL, you can look at the anterior dura, and, and you can see everything so you're relatively safe, and then putting a provisional stabilization. I think the biggest mistake people make when they do that from the front is they're thinking about doing degenerative ACDFs, and they tend to overstack the graft, and then the facets in the back are gapped, and you lose some degree of stability because you've over-distracted the facets. So I think once you have this relocated, I would use a five or six millimeter graft, you know, a very small graft, to allow things to settle and, 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 and fix it in compression, as a because you could put a 27 millimeter graft in there, and, and you know, and, and there's no end point. So you have to be very careful in over-distracting these during surgery. Now, talk us quickly through um, a dislocated neck that you've taken to the operating room. There's this frequent misconception that this is a, quote, easy thing to do in the operating room. Again, assume a bilateral facet dislocation C5-6 and a 300-pound um, uh, offensive linebacker. So uh, wh what is your strategy there? Do you have some tips and tricks of how to facilitate a reduction with an asleep patient in the operating room uh, in that kind of a setting, open or closed? <laughs> Gentlemen. So, so you're, wait, yeah, so you're saying you're doing an open reduction anteriorly. And what, what are the tricks in reducing it? Is that, is that what you're asking? Yes. Yes, sorry, I was late okay. to the microphone. Yeah, so, so I think I showed a little bit. I'm gonna show it in one of my talks a little later. Um, so I put the distractor pins as far away from the injured disc as possible parallel to the end plates. So most of the time these are kyphotic, so they're gonna kinda of almost be crossing, right? I uh, actually use those as joysticks to help, after you've taken the disc out, after you've decompressed the canal, make sure all the neurologic structures are, are decompressed. And then distract off those pins, sort of doing the same thing that we just talked about in a closed reduction, but this time in an open reduction. So distract, what you don't wanna do is just take those pins and, and uh, uh, try to reduce the, the, the deformity right then because the facet joints aren't, aren't distracted enough. So you want to distract, and then once the, the facet joints are tip to tip, then reduce it with putting basically lordosis or pushing the pins away from you at, at their tips, and then allowing the, the uh, traction to come off. What is so true is this issue of potentially over-distracting this. You don't want to do that for all sorts of different reasons, but mostly for neurologic issues, because Dr. Gelb was right. There's no end point. So you need to make sure you, you know the, the, the normal distance, put a lordotic graft in, make sure that those facet joints are perfectly reduced and in a, a, a lordotic position, and then put your plate on. Yeah, and one, one other thing that I'll do is I'll often confirm in the OR with a, a intraoperative CT or stealth just to make sure that those facets aren't too gapped when you do that. And sometimes I'll put some axial manual pressure on that scalp just to try to close that inner space down and get those facets approximated as possible. All right. Does anyone from the audience have any questions or comments at this point? And if not, I'm going to take the, oh, yes, sir. Um, so I see you guys are using the Gardner Wells tongs. If you guys are planning on, let's say, for whatever reason, you wanted to put the patient in a halo uh, prior to 
OR for whatever reason, if you're planning on having them prolonged traction, you wanted to keep them reduced, would you use like a, like the halo um, uh, fixation device and then put them in the vest? In, in my opinion, there's no reason, no reason to do it. I think if you're certain you're going to need a halo, it's inconvenient to put on tongs and then change it. But I think 99% of the time, the tongs are going to get you there. So um, there's no real reason to do that. Well, uh, well, what I was saying, like with with the with the halo ring and then putting traction on that, if you were planning on putting them in a halo well, vest, that, that can be done. The, the I mean, certainly that can be done. It's it's technically possible. It's just that it's hard. As Rick went through before, it, it's harder to put on the halo ring. It it takes longer. And if you're not going to need it, because you because if you fail in your reduction, you're just going to go to the operating room and do it open. There is no real advantage unless you, like I said, unless you're certain for some reason this person is going to need a halo afterwards. I, I see no real. The, the no. one advantage that I'd say some of the beds have a halo attachment to them if you're going to do a posterior afterwards. And if you if you need to fix a bed, if you need to fix a patient to the bed in a posterior manner, then you could avoid afterwards changing the gardener wheels to a Mayfield kind of frame. So that sometimes has an advantage, depends on the setup. And uh, I just think those those circumstances right. are relatively rare. Right, I agree. Oh. One last practical question. Let's say you have a mildly or moderately displaced type two odontoid fracture. Do you put those into traction to keep them aligned until they go to the OR? Patient is neurologically intact. Yes, I put them in garden wells tongs because if I'm going to do an odontoid screw, I want to make sure it's perfectly reduced and I can do that uh, before taking them to the operator, make sure that, that I can do that. So again, by putting rolls underneath their shoulder or, or, or under their head, uh, making sure that we can reduce that odontoid fracture perfectly. I, I tend not to do that for my type two odontoids. I, we ran the experiment when I was a resident in England. We put everybody in Gardner Wells tongs and these poor patients were you know, sitting there for a day or two in Gardner Wells tongs. And you can imagine the amount of aspirations and respiratory problems that we had. Well, that's, a, you're right. Assuming yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm gonna take them to the operating room. Quickly. You're right, yeah. that, that same day. Yeah, don't let them sit around in tongs. Okay, I'm gonna, we're a little bit over time. I'm gonna take the moderator's prerogative. Thank you gentlemen for your insights. Uh, we're gonna.